we've been programmed to think of them kind of mystical, or I'm not even sure what we think about. But if, if, if verse 25, and of course these books were going all over when they wrote, if verse, you need to realize verse 25 would have been of the immediate death sentence. Many people don't realize why Christians were martyred in the first century. They weren't martyred because they had nice little fellowship meals. They were martyred because their message was this man Jesus that had just died and they said resurrected, that everybody knew about now. They were saying he was the king, he was the Lord. And look at verse 25, to the only God. The only God was to be Caesar. Caesar said he is God. And if anybody in the Roman Empire said I am God or somebody else is God, they were death. That was death sentence. That was treasonous. Those first three words alone in the New American, to the only, for God, to the only God, it still is not, Titus. Oh, excuse me. Let me plug it in. Okay, I got it now. My name says the one only God. Uh, the Amplified says the one and only. Yeah, and that's the thought of the, the word. To the only God. Do you realize what that, what that meant in the Roman Empire? See, that, that isn't the gospel. The gospel relates to the good news of right. salvation. This is a statement of fact. And, and then it goes further. Our Savior? Caesar was to be the Savior. You, see, we don't realize this in our kind of democratic, somewhat socialistic place. We don't realize what this is. We preach this sermon, and I don't know what you think. Oh, isn't that nice? He's the only God. He's in heaven. And, but the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and of course, Lord was master. And then he says, be glory. Caesar was supposed to get all the glory, all the majesty, all the dominion. That means rule. Rule? Are you kidding me? The only ruler? He's the only ruler? And authority? He, has, he is the only one that has authority? There's only one person that has authority. And anyone else that has authority, it's only if it's been delegated by God. And if God has delegated them authority, he will support them. Now, there's many treasonous, there's many rebels, but notice that. He's the only one that has all authority before all time and now and forever. Who? It's amazing we don't say yes, sir, to God. <laughs> Whatever he says. If he says jump, I say how high. I mean, we do not fear God. And we and the church and Christians are having all sorts of problems and they don't realize it's because of God's judgment. The Bible says judgment must begin at the house of God. We looked at 1 Corinthians, remember when we, right after the Lord's Supper, the love feast in 1 Corinthians, he said there, because there was sin, many of you are weak, physically weak. Many of you are sick, that's a, even a worse thing, and many have actually died. And Health relates to fearing God more than anything else, more than how you eat, more than vitamins, more than organic food. Your fear of God will affect your health infinitely more than anything biological. There's hundreds of verses on this if you read the book of Proverbs alone. So I believe in eating good. I'm not against eating good. I'm not against, you know, all the health things. But honestly, think of the one promise. He says, if you honor your father and mother, you're going to live well. And you're going to live long. If you take vitamins. Oh. Think of that. I want to tell you, don't believe John 3.16 if you don't believe the other verses. They're either all right or they're all wrong. Now, this, this is going to lead us right back into the, to the book we're going through, and we need to, we're kind of wanting, this is helping us a little bit edit it as we go through it, uh, and a lot are really wanting to get this out in the nation, especially since we've got the elections coming up. 
So I'm going to jump right to it here. And uh, so we're going to try, not maybe every Sunday, but try to take about 30 minutes to get through this for our education, for also the video where it's going out to a lot of people. And uh, <clears throat> if you've not been following it, I really d don't want anybody to pop in the middle or just get pieces because this, this is like a puzzle. And if you don't see the pieces and you come in at a later date on this, you will really not understand. You'll either be confused or really become uh, in, in error. Uh, uh, so if you've not gotten the sequence before uh, on this uh, video or message, you really need to go back and hear because we've laid foundation to bring us to this point, political priority. We have seen from the beginning in Genesis, we had already looked at this, that God mandated his people to multiply and rule, quote unquote. God gave that mandate, the first mandate, be fruitful, multiply, and reign and govern. He gave it to Adam and his family. Then he destroyed the world and started over. He gave it to Noah and his family in Genesis 9. And then it still didn't work good, so he started a family that became a whole race, Abraham, and he gave him the same command. That broke down, and in the middle of our history, Jesus, God's own son, started a family, the spiritual family, Jesus' family, God's family. And number four, as you can see up on the screen, Jesus Christ and his spiritual family are for our day. We're in that age right now. You're not in the age of Adam's family, Noah's family, or Abraham's family. You are in one sense with Abraham by faith. But you're specifically a child of God, and you're an heir. So you, you've been adopted, it says, into Jesus Christ and his family. Jesus calls you brother. He calls you sister. It's his family. Now, he's not going to have any other families. He is going to rule. He's giving us a time, it's been about 2,000 years, for his family to really do what he asked Adam to do, and didn't, was not too successful. Noah to do, who was not too successful. And Abraham, they had success off and on with the, with the nation of Israel. There was times with David's reign and, and some of the other kings that there was a lot of glory. But there was more down than up. And so finally, just like the parable, remember Jesus sent different prophets, he sent different back, he gave that parable where he sent different people back after he planted this, this, this vineyard and all, and they kept killing him. Finally, they, he sent his son, the last one, and they killed the son. That's, that's a picture of Jesus. But we're to be ruling, and, and we looked at this. If you've not seen, the, again, the previous part of this book, uh, where this was laid out, and the church today does not understand this. If we would have shared this, I would have never written this book 150 years ago. All Christians understood this for 1,800 years. This was as common as the gospel is to you. Today, it's, it's utterly lost. And yet there's more on this topic, God's state institution, than there is on God's church, than there is on families. There's more on the state than the other two institutions. Far more than the other two put together. And Christians knew that, and that's why we had reformations and great movements of God. Okay, because they knew they were to reign and they were to rule. That's the mandate. Jesus gave that mandate in the last commission before he resurrected. And if you've not seen that, you have got to go back and understand how the Great Commission is, uh, as we say here, we saw above that Jesus' Great Commission was and is essentially a civil mandate. That does not mean it doesn't include getting the gospel out. It does. But actually, specifically in that verse, it never says get the gospel out. But it says all his commandments, teach him to obey. But it prefaces it, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and disciple, not the church, not people, not families, the state, i.e. nation. Disciple the nation. 
were to disciple the nation. You know, you only go as far as your vision is. If your vision is to jump a, a certain distance uh, versus a higher distance, you, you'll never go further than what your vision is. And God's vision was literally, now, I have all authority, so you go and disciple the nation. And you need to see that to see how that all relates. So we saw in the past here, Jesus' Great Commission was and is essentially a civil mandate. We saw above that God had ordained three of His exclusive institutions, and only three. The family, the state, and the church. Those are the three institutions that God has ordained. Nothing God ordains is to be unholy. He does not want the state to be unholy any more than He wants the church to be unholy, any more than He wants family to be unholy. Can a state be unholy? Yes. Can a family be unholy? Yes. Can a church be unholy? Yes. But that doesn't mean He wants it that way. It's only unholy because you and I, the people of God, are not obeying God and causing the church to be holy and causing our family to be holy and causing our state to be holy. We saw how God has ordained all three of His institutions for His purposes and glory, and therefore for all three to be holy and subject to His rule and law. So what actual priority does God want politics to be for the church today? Most would say zero. In fact, go the opposite direction. You're going to see something amazing in this little section. Or Christians to be politically active, addressing the civil issues of the day. First, it should be realized that unrighteous civil leaders will always try to legislate Christian speech out of the marketplace, as they have in much of America, in all of the public schools, universities, now in most public institutions, in the public arena in general. For Satan knows, and his most active agents know, if Christians wake up to their God-given biblical civil mandate, Satan and his predators will quickly be suppressed instead of the other way around. It is for this reason that our founding pilgrims came to this nation in the first place, as they said, to establish a new nation, i.e., quote, New Israel. But in 1954, while the Christians were sleeping, Senator Lyndon Johnson, along with other unrighteous senators, passed a bill to prohibit any church to be able to keep their 501c3 nonprofit status if that church or pastor used the, pub, the pulpit to endorse or oppose any persons running for political office. Nobody knew that happened. In 1954, when Lyndon Johnson signed that into law, they immediately said if any pastors or the church is, has any political activity or endorses or promotes any godly candidate or condemns any ungodly candidate, Boom, the state's going to take its money away from you. I say here in the book, that was the beginning of the state quietly encroaching on the jurisdiction of the church, which jurisdiction God never gave to the state. At that point, the state became treasonous to God, the state's supreme ruler. This was a legislative demonic knife thrust right into the heart of our churches, it would now no longer be legal for pastors to have free speech in their own churches to identify the godly biblical candidates from the ungodly candidates. In one quick fell swoop, they legislated churches right out of all political influence of God's state institution. Now the church is supposed to be legally barred from directing influence the state, one of its two primary mandates. Christians accepted this tyrannical law without even a whimper, but most churches had already lost their God-given biblical vision for political influence. Most Christians never knew this legislation was passed. Most pastors had already theologically abdicated their God-given mandate for the state, thinking the state is not to be God's domain, but even Satan's domain. Now as time has marched on, the majority of non-biblical civil leaders have legislatively encroached much further into God's other two institutions, the church and the family. For example, with family, child abuse laws are themselves becoming abusive. 
Social workers are targeting more homes where Christian parents are attacked as being abusive if they are lovingly disciplining their children biblically. For generations now, parents have lost their freedom to educate their own children without the state interfering. However, the state knows it will always have the majority of kids to go to their government schools when all parents have to pay real estate taxes for their government schools even if their kids don't go to them. Most parents don't think about what educational freedom they would have if they were not required to pay real estate taxes for the government schools. Real estate taxes, land tax, is the money that's used to support the government schools. Land tax is the one tax that God condemned in the Old Testament. He said, the earth belongs to me. Satan, of course, wanted to take that and have that tax go to his indoctrination system, which is really our public and virtually government schools today. That's why the educational voucher system is demonized by union, teachers' union and other leftist statists. The voucher system, as you probably know or should know, uh, is where the state has to give back money to, to uh, parents and families so they can use that money that they've taken from us. It's not the state's money. They're giving back our money so that we can use it to send our kids to any school we want to, a Christian school or home school or whatever. Uh, and of course, the teachers union and all the leftists will fight tooth and nail because they have encroached and they want to keep their control for their indoctrination schools. They don't want to, the state to lose control of indoctrinating our children. Pastors that are more concerned about losing their church state exempt status than their prophetic calling are not worthy to be called pastors. Nonetheless, most pastors are not even coming close to any legal conflict and doing all they could still uh, to affect the state. But pastors that now see God's biblical mandate for their churches to engage in taking back our nation for God can get free counsel and support through one of several good Christian legal organizations. One such strong organization is Liberty Council. I bring that out there just for any that are in trouble or are needing legal help. I happen to know Matt Staver. He's the head of this and uh, the head of the legal dean of uh, the law school at Liberty University. He used to be, uh, we, he, used to, he was an investor with me in our television group in Florida. And now he's over the uh, whole law department and uh, God has used their group mightily. King George of England called the American Revolution what? The Presbyterian Revolution. Because so many early American Presbyterian pastors were preaching the moral justification for the American War of Independence. Without them, there would have never been any American War of Independence, and you and I wouldn't be here today. Yet it was not a popular thing for all pastors at that time any more than it is today. About one-third of the nation wanted to stay with England, adamantly. About a third wanted to break away from England, and about a third were not strong one way or the other. Yet, a critical mass of pastors did take the courageous moral high ground and sounded the clear bugle call that eventually moved the whole nation to their righteous cause and ultimate victory. But still today, all Christians have personal responsibility to obey God's mandate, to have godly state under God's civil law, regardless of despondent pastors or even pastors in opposition. God wants pastors to be spiritual leaders, but every verse in the Bible, you're to obey. You can, when you get to heaven and stand before Jesus Christ, well, my pastor didn't tell me, or my pastor didn't do it. You are responsible as a Christian for every verse in that book, whether your spiritual leaders do it or not. Jesus founded his church with all non-professional lay people. And all his spiritual leaders were non-professional lay people. With the first church meeting in the upper room in, G in Jerusalem, not one of the men or women were spiritual professionals. They were all lay people, from fishermen to former prostitutes, from despised tax collectors to redirected political zealots. No movement of God in all of history ever took place without a majority uprising coming from the everyday common man and woman of God. It never came from the, 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 what would be considered the clergy. Never. No great revival, no great movement of God, including the first one with Jesus Christ and his disciples. 
The left-wing liberal churches have done far more to move the country away from God and His Word than the evangelicals have to move the nation towards God and His Word, and they have the Spirit of God in them. The liberal churches in recent years have politically mobilized. They get their leftist Christians, end quote, into the highest office of the land. Their political sermons and political actions have done more to undermine our Christian nation, schools, families, than a thousand evangelical churches preaching their nice apolitical sermons behind closed doors, oblivious to our nation being radically de-Christianized. So nonprofit tax laws must never be an excuse or be feared in losing. The godless in America have been working for generations to arrest America from its godly heritage. Such theological liberals have not only been effectively influencing our evangelical churches and seminaries, but are now mostly in control of our civil government, preschool through university. I was just recently in California with our nephews. One of them was in fifth grade and the other one was in first grade. Three of the things that I saw in their notebook. They were teaching environmentalism, multiculturalism, and one other immoral anti-biblical philosophy, drawing little pictures in grade school. Now in California, it's a law that if a little grade school boy says, I feel like a girl today, they have to let him go into the girl's restroom or in the girl's locker room, in the shower room, or vice versa. That's a law. And if you prohibit him, you can be fined or go to jail. You wait until that gets rolling. And of course, this, very, this next month, our so-called Supreme Court is going to make their decision on whether there should be uh, homosexual marriages. And that is going to be the ruination overnight of this country. You wait and see by this time next year. Because they can go into any church, any group, any business, and, and if you don't hire them, they will use discrimination against you. And some of the judges that are also homosexual, sodomites, they will rule in favor of them, and churches will be shut down, business will be shut down, and Christians will start going into jail. You wait. This is recorded. You can look at it 12 months from now behind bars. There's going to be a lot. It's already starting to happen without the law as strong as it is today. Christians don't have a clue what's going on, so many. I had a, a, a Christian leader here who was sitting right here in the sofa with us in California. That was the leading editor for John MacArthur's books and went to the seminary. He was a Greek scholar. He and his wife didn't have a clue what was going on in, the, in, the, in our nation. My wife mentioned some political things that are in the news day and night. Didn't have a clue. My wife later said, she, I can't believe it. We don't know what's happening. If you don't know what's happening, it says, that's why the prophet said, we die for lack of knowledge. Such theological liberals have not only been effectively influencing our evangelical churches and seminaries, now are mostly in control of our civil government, our preschool through university, the entertainment world, and most of our mass media. As a result of our Christian forefathers, quote, sleeping at the switch for the last hundred years, the godless humanists have now taken over the train. And now today, Christians' taxes continue to feed their coal car for driving the train ever faster to the abyss. Today, the United States... About half the population votes for civil leaders that not only advocate immoral policies and law, but some which are openly immoral themselves and are sodomites themselves and promoting it. They are anti-God's law in governing our nation. Millions promote abortion, homosexual marriages, euthanasia, and a host of other godless actions, while at the same time condemning biblical law as capital punishment for murder, rape, and many other such biblical laws. Christians are increasingly coming under more shrill attack by the godless. The handwriting is on the wall. A generation ago, their godless laws threw out the Bible, prayer, and the Ten Commandments in all public schools. Today, they are throwing out Christians who say, God bless you and working to push all Christians into total silence. Whatever, quote, church-state separation, end quote, there was to be, it was wholly intended to protect the church from the state, not the state from the influence and direction of God and His Word. However, today it's more. It's, quote, God get out of the state. 
In the Bible, there is church-state separation. Even as there is to be separation jurisdiction with all of God's institutions, church, state, and family. Today, when people say church-state separation, they're really trying to separate God from the institution. But technically, they're right. Practically, they're wrong. Technically, they're right because the Bible does have church-state separation, just like it has family-state separation. But it doesn't ever have God separation from state or the Bible's mandate on state. So if you weren't here earlier, you, you won't understand that. But this is very important. But never is there to be God state or biblical state separation. Just as God is to be over the church, even so God is to be Lord over the state. The Bible says God is Lord over heaven and earth. But the real problem is not the homosexuals. It's not the immoralist. It's not the evolutionist. Not really any of the unrighteous. The real problem is with the righteous. Only the righteous can bring in righteousness. By passive default, we the Christians have slowly abdicated our civil mandate responsibility for Jesus Christ to, quote, go and disciple the nations, end quote. The scripture says men die for lack of knowledge. God's church in this generation has lost its theological foundation for even knowing all three mandates, much less fighting for them. Some pastors even preach against this. How can they be so good and right when it comes to the family and church institutions and yet so blind when it comes to God's state institution? What priority did Jesus give in his ministry to politics, civil leaders, and civil law? Many would say Jesus never got involved in politics. But it's overtly obvious when understanding what Jesus and everyone in his day knew who the following groups of people really were in his day. Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was not just a religious council, but the highest national civil body of governmental and civil leaders. This body of civil leaders resided in the capital city of Jerusalem of Judea during the time of Jesus. It was like a combination of the U.S. Congress, executive branch, and the judicial branches of the United States government, all in one civil body. It was made up of 71 elders from the two major political parties of their day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the high priest were head of the Sanhedrin. This was not just a religious body, it was, a civil, it was the exclusive civil body. There was no other civil body. Lesser Sanhedrins, throughout the country of Judea, they had also had what they called lesser Sanhedrins. These were the local bodies of civil governments in the local cities in Judea. All the lesser Sanhedrins were made up of only 23 elders. They all functioned in the local cities and the same as the Great Sanhedrin did in Jerusalem, except the Great Sanhedrin was like the U.S. Supreme Court of the nation. High priest, they were the highest civil leaders in the Sanhedrin. They were somewhat like a combination of a president or speaker of the house in the U.S. or like prime minister in other civil governments. Elders. These were not men like elders in today's churches, but rather the 71 civil rulers that made up the great Sanhedrin in the capital city of Jerusalem, Judea. They were also what the men were called who were the civil rulers in the lesser Sanhedrins in all the other cities in Judea, each of them made up of 23 elders. Scribes. These men were the civil lawyers, constitutional lawyers of their day. These were the men that were learned in the Mosaic law and the very evolving and growing Jewish theoristic written and oral law. This was their civil law. If you want to say it's religious, that's fine. It was their religious civil law. Probably an example today is with the Muslims, with Sharia law. They consider that religious, but it is also their civil law. So it was in Jesus' day. They were the interpreters, the scribes were the interpreters, the lawyers, the teachers of the law. The scribes examined the more difficult and subtle questions of the law. Since the advice of men skilled in the law was needed in the examination of the causes and the solutions of the more difficult legal questions, these men were enrolled in the Sanhedrin in support of the Pharisees and Sadducees, just like our congressmen have lawyers all around them. The word Pharisees, when you read the word Pharisees, what do you think of? The Pharisees were not just religious leaders, but they were considered the largest and most influential of the two major political parties in Judea. 
In their day, what may be referred to as the religious law was in fact the civil law. The Pharisees were the religious political party in principle, similar to what the Democratic Party is today. They were more of the blue collar political party. They were the more like the political left wing progressives of the Democratic Party today in that they were not strict constitutionalists regarding their mosaic constitution law. Democrats today believe it's kind of a, a living constitution. They're constantly changing it. And, uh, and, and the Pharisees were this way. They were constantly adding to God's mosaic law. That's why Jesus, when he was contending to them, he says, your traditions, and you're violating the law of God. Remember? He said that. It's verse after verse after verse. He was contending, contending against them because they were the ones that were oppressing the people in Israel. And it was their laws. They were proponents of continually adding their civil religious traditions to the Mosaic law, their constitution. They were for greater government control of everyone, just like the Democrats today, for bigger government. They were political elitist. They were consistently adding and growing their traditions to the religious civil law, which were overbearing and burdensome to the people. Remember he said in Matthew 23, you're burdensome. The Pharisees claimed to honor Moses and be adherents of the Mosaic civil law, just like many Democrats do. Their con which was their constitution, but Jesus was constantly condemning and exposing them for adding their traditions to the law, which was the civil law of the land. Jesus was continually exposing their hypocrisy and showing how they were actually hypocrites and violating their constitution, i.e., the Mosaic civil law. Matthew 15, 1 through 9, Matthew 23, 1 through 4 are just some of the many places in the Gospels where we see Jesus contending with the Pharisees regarding the Mosaic religious civil law. Every time Jesus was, now listen to this, Every time Jesus was contending with the Pharisees about the law, it was in fact the civil law. Jesus was mightily contending in the public Pharisee political arena of his day all the time. All the time. Remember, the man that Jesus said is the greatest man that's ever been born of woman was put to death because he said the civil leader, the top leader, Herod, he was talking with him and saying, you got married immorally against God's law. He wasn't sharing the gospel with him. He said, you're breaking the law of God. So he put him to death. So with Barack Obama, share the gospel with him, that's fine. But if John the Baptist was here, who was the greatest man that was ever born a man, according to Jesus, he would be condemning him for promoting homosexuality, sodomy. He would be condemning him for promoting abortion. That's what he would go to him with. Not the gospel, if you follow John the Baptist's example. Think of that. And that's who he'd have gone to. Obama, the number one man in the land. Herod, King Herod, he was the tops. And he went to him about his personal life and how he was wrong. You see, the law in the land, the further it gets away from the law of God, <clears throat> the less the land is fertile for people being saved. Many people say, I want to just share the gospel and see people saved. Well, I want to too. <coughs> but when the civil law moves away from God's civil law, the field becomes less ripe and there's so much on this subject, which we'll get into, but I want to just close off here in just a few minutes. We'll get into that later in other chapters. The Sadducees <clears throat> were also just some religious, were not just some religious sect, but were the other major political party in Jesus' day. The Sadducees were more in principle like the Republican Party is today. They were more, there were more Pharisees than Sadducees, even as there are more registered Democrats than Republicans today. The Sadducees were the more conservative party. They generally rejected the Pharisee progressive ideas of adding to the Mosaic law through the oral law traditions. The Sadducees prided themselves in being more strict and literal constitutionalist. In other words, strict followers of only the Mosaic civil law. But the Sadducees were also political elit elitists who wanted to maintain their priestly caste. But they were willing to incorporate a modern Hellenisticism in their culture, something the Pharisees opposed. The Sadducees did not believe in afterlife as they were blind in seeing that their Torah, the written Mosaic law, they were blind in seeing that in the Torah. 
which is the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. The main focus of the Sadducees' life was ritual associated with the temple. They were more the professional business and white collar class. The Sadducees and Pharisees were the two political parties that made up the Sanhedrin, which was the responsibility to interpret and execute all civil religious law of their nation in their day. The Essenes, they was, this was one other much smaller splintered political group, the Essenes, they had little political influence. They merged out of disgust with both of the other two major religious political parties. They might be compared somewhat like the libertarian political party today. This group believed in all the other political parties that were corrupted at the city and the temple. They were more separatists. Many even moved out of Jerusalem and lived a monastic life in the desert, adopting strict dietary laws, and many even committed to celibacy. The Essenists are believed to be an offshoot of the group that lived in the Quorum uh, near the Dead Seas. In 1947, a Bedouin shepherd stumbled into a cave containing various ancient artifacts and jars containing manuscripts. The most important documents were the earliest known copies of the Old Testament. The content found in these scrolls dramatically confirmed the authenticity of the exact same Old Testament books in the Bible we are using today. The Temple Guards. Remember reading about the Temple Guards? These men might be compared to what our city police force is today. They were guarding what might be like our national capital today. They were operating under the jurisdiction and authority of the Pharisees and Sadducees of the Sanhedrin. Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was appointed to be the governor overseeing Judah for Rome. The Roman governor's primary function was to make sure there was no insurrections and oversee the collection of the imperial taxes. He was not to interfere in their national or local civil laws, punishments, fines, arrests, or carrying out any of the local civil law, with the only exception to approve any death sentences which the Sanhedrin adjudicated. That's why they had to bring Jesus to Pontius Pilate before they could execute him. And he said, he's innocent. But they said, no, we want to crucify him. They said, okay, take, take off. He had the veto power, and they had to, that's why they brought it to him. But that's the only thing he really had anything to do politically. Remember the Sanhedrin? They got the 12 apostles in. They beat him, and they scourged him, and they told them it's against the law to be preaching out there. Uh, they could arrest people. They could find people. These, this was the political system. This was where Jesus was battling day and night. What about Herod Antipas? Herod was the Roman ruler appointed over Galilee where Jesus grew up, re resided, and did much of his ministry. Herod was the leading civil ruler that John the Baptist publicly condemned. John the Baptist also publicly criticized Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, for marrying Herodias, his brother's wife, and for many other wrongs he had done. Interesting. Remember, he's the man that Jesus said is the greatest man ever born a woman. He was condemning him for the wrongs he was doing. So Herod put John in prison, adding this sin to his many others. John chapter, Luke 3, uh, 19 through 20. Herod arrested John, eventually beheaded him. John was not arrested and executed for preaching to believers or for even preaching the gospel, but rather for publicly and specifically condemning many wrongs of the highest civil and political ruler in the land. Think of that. Did John the Baptist make a serious mistake or even hurt the name of God for doing this? If you did this today, many Christian pastors would say this is wrong to do and also say, look at the shameful results, even getting arrested. But not so with Jesus. After John the Baptist was arrested for publicly condemning the top political civil leader in the day for his wrong actions, Jesus said, quote, I tell you the truth, all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist, Matthew 11, 11. I wonder if Jesus is, a is asking, where are the John the Baptists of our day? The civil law in Jesus' day was the Mosaic law of God. Those corrupting the civil law in Jesus' day in the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, were constantly trying to add their traditions to the Mosaic law of the day. The Pharisee prolific oral law was later written down in the Talmud, but it was never God's law of Scripture. To say that Jesus was not politically active is to totally misunderstand most of what was going on in the Gospels. Most. Jesus was continually contending with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and all of whom were political and civil leaders in his day. They had the exclusive civil power to arrest, to put in trial, to adjudicate, 
punishments, fines, beatings, and whippings. They even had the power to adjudicate the death sentence less the governor's veto. Even in the case of Jesus, after Pontius Pilate publicly declared him innocent, he still did not veto Jesus' death sentence in fear of going against the political system sham verdict of the Pharisees and Sadducees of the Sanhedrin. The Pharisees and Sadducees were the local civil authorities in the day of Jesus. Look at what they did not only look at what they did not only to Jesus, but also in the book of Acts, continually exercising their civil authority in arresting Peter and John, then arresting and whipping all the apostles, then even putting Stephen, James, and many others to death without any Roman approval. They were so irate, they didn't do that. Even Saul, a Pharisee, under the authority of the Sanhedrin, was going everywhere arresting believers until he was converted to Christ himself. The original question of this section is, did the Apostle Paul ever command the church to have political influence? That's the title of this chapter, this section. What would you think of if I said yes? And what would you think of if I said that, that, that the Apostle Paul said it is to be the church's first priority? We're going to stop there next week. Did Paul say it is to be the church's responsibility to influence the political system in the state? And what would you think if I said that the Apostle Paul said it is to be the church's first priority? We will see that the Scripture actually teaches that. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. And God, we pray that we'll be humble and broken men and women to not throw out things that are good and right that we know and that we've learned, but help us to be humble, to not presume we know it all, but to be what you said, to be disciples, which means to be perpetual students, to keep learning. And we thank you for your word, because we want to really be, not just be presumptuous and assume that we're involved in your work, when in many ways we may be just skirting the surface and not, like a military army, we may be back in the mess hall, eating food and singing nice little hymns and having nice little prayer meetings and we're not even in the front line, we're not even engaging in the primary battle that your people gave their lives for. And so as we go through this, help us to uh, extract the precious from the worthless. Help us to not despise prophetic utterances, but to prove all things from your word and then to hold fast what is good. No wonder you said, Paul, of those that Paul said of those uh, uh, Bereans, they were more noble because they searched the Scripture to see if these things are so. Lord, I'm glad that we search the Scripture to see if what we're sharing is so. And I just thank you for your word. And Lord, now we just want to bless you and take this bread and this cup. We remember you died to give life and that you're worthy of being the ruler of heaven and earth and, and being the ruler in our life to be the ruler in our nation to be the ruler in our church, to be the ruler in our family. Just lead us now in giving thanks to you, in Christ's name, who alone is, has all authority, all dominion, in Jesus' name.